Hey, everybody. Welcome to Kurt Schilling Baseball Show, episode 46. Got a little bit of a chest thing going, so bear with me. Uh, lots to talk about this week. Billy, good afternoon. Been 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 a week. How you doing, buddy? Uh, has been a week, Kurt. But as you said, lots to talk about. Interesting, of, uh, interesting stuff. Yeah, it, I guess if if this show had a sweet spot, it would be in that spot where uh, I, I can talk about some things that maybe people just don't understand or don't know or don't see. And a lot of this week is is that stuff. And we're going to start off uh, in uh, Chicago with the White Sox. Uh, Kenyon Middleton. Yep. Never heard of him either. Um, he's a middle reliever uh, who was traded at the deadline. And uh, he apparently had a uh, an interview and he had some very interesting things to say, um, which probably helped to define why the White Sox are where they are. Um, they, they were sellers at the deadline, uh, but Middleton came out and said they were plagued by a, a culture, quote unquote, that had no rules in which rookie uh, regularly fell asleep in the bullpen, White Sox reliever, uh, uh, the White, White Sox reliever said on Sunday, he was sent to the Yankees at the deadline. And he, this is a quote. We came in with no rules, talking about the White Sox this year. I don't know how you police the culture if there are no rules or guidelines to follow because everyone is doing their own thing. Like, how do you say anything about it because there are no rules? You have rookies sleeping in the bullpen during the game. You have guys missing meetings. You have guys missing PFP, which is pitcher fundamental practice, pitcher's fielding practice, and there are no consequences for any of this stuff. He went on to talk about uh, Lance Lynn and uh, Kendall Graveman uh, playing the WBC, which this was not something that I factored in, even though I've never been a big fan of the WBC for pitchers. If you're trying to create culture, you need your big dogs. Those guys that played in the WBC are our big dogs. And those are the guys I feel like can police the things that are happening. There's no gelling of the team. We're supposed to find our identity in spring training so we can roll out for the season. If you don't find your identity, you're scuffling from day one. All that stuff. They're 24th in RBIs, 24th in ERA, 25th in runs, 27th in OPS. They're playing like crap. They have been. They were 500 last year. They're 23 games under. They're out of it this year. And, and like I said, they were sellers. But there's a lot of things to unpack right there. First off, uh, Bill, it's Pedro Griffal, right? Is the manager? Yes. yes. First year? First year. First year manager. Um, that explains so much. And, and one of the reasons why... So listen, managers, I would say, have less of an impact on wins and losses in most cases than any other coach, staff, head coach, manager in, in professional sports. Their job, and 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 I don't. I think that's always been true, um, but I think it's revealed itself over the last thirty or forty years, uh, much more so. A, a manager's job, and you've heard me say this, you've got to put your players in a position to succeed. To do that, you have to know your players, or you have to have a very strict code of conduct. And then by strict, I mean it has to be defined. And one of the reasons why I thought Terry Francona was so good early as a manager, and he he got fired in Philadelphia because the players sucked and we were a bad team. But uh, a player will come in, a manager will come in on the first day. And the first day of spring training, that's your first impression. Now, you might have phone calls with some of the players when you get hired um, and, and meet some of the guys or whatever. But your first, you're in front of the whole organization because that first day of spring training, there's usually 50 to 60 guys. And they're your top prospects, your 40-man roster all your coaching staff uh, and you have a tone to set or, or if you don't realize that you have a tone to set, but you do, you set a tone. And I can remember Terry's first day as a manager in spring training, talking about, uh, you know, if I have to, if I have to put a curfew out there, guys, that's a problem. If, if you can't be in bed and get your rest and uh, you know, and, and and he had loose guidelines off the field, but it was, you know, be where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. Uh, play the show up. Most importantly, was play the game hard, play the game right. And we had a we had a, um, and I was part of the little group of of oldest players on the team at the time that that policed that. Um, I'm guessing that Pedro Grafal didn't come in with any of that, um, because all of the things here. Uh, would never happen under uh, you, you, your bullpen coach is your is your bullpen coach 
in a sense. Uh, a reliever falling asleep in the bullpen, I can't even fathom, number one. Um, guys missing meetings, guys missing fundamental pitchers practice. Um, that stuff doesn't happen under uh, – and I don't want to say under a good manager. I want to say under a defined manager, a guy who's laid out his terms and conditions. Now, you can have – you'll have people talk about – and this is, I think, kind of a fascinating thing. When Buck Showalter – was hired to manage the Diamondbacks. They were two years from fielding a team. And Buck took control of everything from the build out of the clubhouse to, I mean, he even brought Cal Rifkin in to walk through the clubhouse and things like, why would you build the washers and dryers for the clubhouse guys at this height? And the, I, and Cal said he did, they, they, or Buck said he did it because Cal told him that when he stayed after with the guys and helped the guys in the clubhouse, when they would wheel the clothing carts up to the washers and dryers, they would either have to go in and empty them, or you could actually build them the right way and just empty them. And it was, it was a small little detail minutia thing, but some guys are like that. Other guys aren't the whole clubhouse. The organization was all that way. Now the problem became that when, when Jerry Colangelo hired people in marketing, people in the clubhouse, people in other places, they never went to buck to tell him he was no longer in charge of things. So there were people in those positions in marketing and PR and all the other things who got pissed because Buck was overstepping his bounds, but Buck saw himself as in control of everything until he was given uh, until he was told otherwise. And it was a, a crisscross of messages on the other side of things would have been coming in and saying nothing and doing nothing and letting the pieces fall where they may, which you can't do that. There's too many chefs in the kitchen in a baseball organization to allow the different things to kind of, you have to have a, an organizational message. And that, that includes everything and everyone from your clubhouse personnel to your team, to your staff, to your training staff, to traveling people, all of it. And that starts at the top. It starts with the owner, but it really starts with the manager. He's in control of all that stuff. The good general managers don't get in the way. They don't go in the clubhouse. They don't meddle with stupid stuff like that. Um, and the good managers understand that. Or in Arizona, Bob Melvin wasn't, or, or Bob Bradley wasn't a guy who was super clubhouse oriented or who had a huge influence in the clubhouse. He didn't have meetings and all this other stuff, but he had Bob Melvin, who might have been one of the best organizers uh, and, and assistant managers I ever played for. And, and you knew he'd make a great manager. Same thing with, with uh, Brad. Uh, um, Oh my God, Brad Mills, uh, Terry's assistant for his entire career. They were the guys that were kind of the 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 non commissioned officers of the group, where they ran the thing when the manager was absent. And if the manager has to be present to influence and affect his rules, he's not managing. He's he's kind of managing in ab absentia in many ways. But that all trickles down from the manager to the leaders, and generally you'll have. And I had meetings with certain managers and different managers about stuff like this. And it's you start it in spring training. You know, I was a guy who, when Terry came in, I had I had a couple of years I was established, but I made it a point in spring training that if you, we had a four field uh, complex, and we had drill, we had a time. Brad Mills had it timed out like the Marine he was that all four fields had a, a exercises and activities at specific times. Now, I was in a place in my career where I could have finished the drill and walked to the next field and started the next drill. I ran between every station I was at because it, I was setting precedent and I was setting, and it was the, the, the mindset was if, if the, if the veteran guy on the team does, it, then we have to do it too. And that was something Terry asked of us and, and that his players got. And when you see, I don't know if you remember Bill, a couple years back when the Cubs won it um, and, and Theo had traded for David Ross. Yeah. And everybody was kind of questioning the move and, as somebody who I knew exactly what the move was. David Ross was one of those guys. David Ross, along with Anthony Rizzo and other guys, he was a guy in the clubhouse that was going to, to do the job that Joe Madden wanted his veterans to do. And it's a crucial piece. It's an incredibly crucial piece. And, um, you know, you I talked to Doug Mirabella, you guys that have been following the show, heard that he was one of those guys too. It didn't matter because your statistics don't dictate leadership. Because And a lot of times they can't because managers now – are guys that never played in the big leagues. So how do they get and command the respect? But it comes down to knowing your players and all that starts. And this is all a long-winded story of, 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 and, and a why of 
why the Red White Sox are probably where they are is when you have a when you don't have culture, you don't have anything. You have 25 millionaires showing up whenever they feel like it, doing whatever they feel like doing, whenever they feel like doing it. And that's what you get. And what it also can get you is uh, leading into the next story, it can get you knocked out at second base. Um, Jose Ramirez and Tim Anderson went at it the other day. And I actually didn't, um, I didn't, well, I didn't see it for a couple of days, <laughs> but then I watched it and um, apparently Tim Anderson has a reputation around the game uh, of being a guy who, uh, I don't know, standoffish. I don't know what the word is. Uh, maybe Jeff can't like, he had a, 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 not a lot of guys on other teams like him, which, you know, as a guy that's the Tim Anderson teammate, I really wouldn't care. But uh, Anderson slid into second base head first. He slid through, uh, or, or Ramirez did. He slid through Anderson's legs. And I, I I saw the video, and it was Anderson, I think, was or Ramirez was reaching up to get a hand pulled up, and Anderson backed off. And they said something to each other. And they squared off. Like, boxing squared off, and, and Ramirez knocked Anderson out. And when I say knocked him out, I mean he knocked him out. He was unconscious. He was unconscious on the way to the ground. Which, uh, man, I can't tell you. That sucks because that video is there for the rest of his life. And it's there for all to see for the rest of their lives. And if I'm Cleveland and I'm the video board operator, there's a pretty good chance that highlight finds its way into the mix when Tim Anderson's coming to the plate and the White Sox are in town. Um, but that's what you got to be ready for. I mean, I, I found myself on the bottom of one fight uh, and that was the last one I ever was on the bottom of. I, I was the, the next week I called a dear friend of mine who was a martial arts instructor and took martial arts for the next year, couple of years, uh, because I didn't ever want to, not that I wanted to kick somebody's ass, but I wanted to be in a position to not get hurt because there's so much stuff that can happen. And you can always see, <clears throat> and this was a good fight, by the way, there were some real fights going on. Um, and I've been in a couple where there were real fights, but baseball fights tend to be this swirling mass of guys yelling real loud um every now and then you'll have the guy who sucker punches somebody and you don't ever want to be in that situation my first fight in the well, i was with the orioles in the late 80s and we got into a fight and i believe it might have been with the white Sox. i can't remember anyway i went out and i grabbed mike Devereaux, our our center fielder to pull him out and i got almost got my butt kicked after the fight by mike Devereaux because you don't ever ever grab your own teammate in a fight i didn't know that I've been in a total of maybe one. I don't even know if I was in a fight in the minor leagues, but I you don't ever grab your own teammate because then you make them susceptible to the knockout. And uh, that was a lesson learned very quickly. Never did it again. Um, but uh, I was in some good ones. I was on a couple good teams with them. The 93 Phillies, we fought everybody. Uh, we fought the Cardinals, I think, three times in spring training. We hated the Cardinals. Um, but it was all, uh, it was, we were trying to establish a reputation of, listen, you can beat us uh, in the box score, but you'll never beat us uh, up. And no one did. We had a, a monstrously angry, massively, uh, 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 just a big team. We had a lot of six, five, six, seven guys. And it's a thing, too. I know this sounds, in this woke culture, it sounds funny, but machismo is a thing, um, a real thing in baseball, in sports. In sports. Yeah. And, and proving that you're tough. It's not what it used to be because Nolan Ryan uh, would have probably beat into submission every hitter in the big leagues these days after they tried to charge him. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it. and again, you know, I, I think uh, 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 John had asked, uh, was the fight justified? You know what? I, I don't ever, there's always underlying tension to some degree between teams or players on certain teams. And that was, uh, I don't know what the history is there, but there clearly was something going on. There and, has to be a backstory yeah, there. Yeah, there is. And actually what you saw was um, uh, afterwards, uh, I think Ramirez said something to the effect that it's not the first time Anderson's disrespected him or disrespected the game. Um, I'll tell you, one know what my favorite part of that was? Bill, hmm. DeMarlo Hale 
who is one of my favorite human beings ever and should have been a manager 10 years ago. Um, one of, one of my favorite coach, one of the great best coaches I've ever been around. And, and again, is a manager, uh, 10 times over when it broke up and got back and broke up and got back. Like he was physically going after somebody like the Marlo <laughs> Hale was like, and this dude, tomorrow's got to be in his seventies, but he looked like a little spry Mike Tyson. Uh, and I, it was inspiring to see, uh, God bless you, my friend. It's good to see you're healthy and doing well. Um, but those are, and you have, again, a lot of these coaching staffs are former players who played against each other. There are tensions yeah. on that level too. And you'll hear the chirping from across the field and see it a lot of times. Um, we're going to stay in the clubhouse uh, and move up to a situation that probably didn't get the press it should have gotten, uh, or I don't know if it should have gotten, but it was a bigger deal than I think it was printed uh, and made out to be. Uh, in Boston, Alex Verdugo uh, was scratched uh, about an hour or two before the game, I believe, is what it was saying. Uh, and here's the comments, and I'll get to the commentary afterwards. And Alex, who is a, a who is a people manager uh, in, in the extreme, and, and and not too light a point to put on this, Alex is a multi uh, lang multilingual guy, which for managers is a big deal. He speaks very obviously Spanish is his first language, and he speaks very fluent and very clean English, which helps him in the clubhouse. It, it's an enormous help. Um, he said, "I decided not to play him, Verdugo." I think today we took a step back as a team, Cora said. We have to make sure everybody is available every single day here for us to get where we want to go. And that wasn't the case. As a manager, I got to take charge of this. And I decided he wasn't going to play. He reiterated multiple times, and this is not a small thing, that Verdugo wasn't going to play and the outfielder wasn't available. Uh, Verdugo's hitting 270. Uh, and not it don't care eight home runs for blah 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 um but if you remember i don't know if you remember the deal that got verdugo there um it was the big trade the bets trade mookie uh, yeah right and and he was the big prospect but i also remember a lot of uh there was a lot of discussion around some stuff that had happened with him in the minor leagues pretty serious stuff i think there were sexual harassment allegations and some other stuff um but he was clear, didn't get indicted, but he was clearly a, a, a guy with some issues. Um, and I like to think people can change, uh, and they do. But in a lot of cases, when you're talking about a 22, 23, 24-year-old professional athlete, they are what they are. They are what they are. And 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 that's, that's both good and bad. Um, and uh, I, I, I've never – I've watched him play. Clearly, he's a talented kid. Um, but his 270, 343, 424 slash line is not what they were after when uh, they traded Mookie Betts. They were after something a lot bigger. Um, well, and this is all coming off of the trade deadline where his name was floated the whole time. And it that can affect you when you're... Well, especially that. if you're an immature player. Right, right. right? Which you clearly are if this happened. So what I'm what I'm saying is that something happened in the clubhouse to the degree that it was public. And by public, I mean all the players saw it and heard it. Because if they hadn't, Alex Cora wouldn't have said anything. If this had happened within the confines of the manager's office, no one would know. Alex is not that guy. Alex is a very Terry Francona guy in the sense that what happens in the manager's office generally for the most part stays in the manager's office until it can't. Until something happens in front of the other players that you can't, if you try to explain it away, they're going to see through you as a guy that that can be walked on. And that clearly something happened. And you don't become the centerpiece of the Mookie Betts trade. And uh, a couple of years later, while he's out there trying to win MVPs and coming close to doing it, uh, you're a trade bait. That's a failed trade is what that is. And yeah. um, the Red Sox are now in last. Uh, and I'm not really sure what anybody thought was going to happen with the Red Sox at the deadline. I don't think that they were even remotely set up to be uh, uh, a team that was going to jump and contend. Um, but when a manager like Alex Cora, and this is not all managers, but when a man like, manager like Alex Cora says and does something this publicly, the player has committed a grievous sin in many, many ways. And it's a sin that I promise you the 25 other guys on the Red Sox roster agree with what the manager said. And that's a problem. 
that's a problem for the player. And what that also tells me is we go back to the White Sox discussion. There's nobody in the clubhouse to address this. Because if there was, and I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, this is going to probably cut off some content in the end, but I think it's a, an important story. Back in 2004, when we traded Nomar Garcia Parra um, to, uh, and got Dave Robertson, Doug Mankiewicz, and all the things that went with that, um, Nomar was in a situation starting a spring training that was just this, this uh, albatross hanging over the team's head. He, he And at the deadline, he basically made it known to the organization he wasn't going to be completely available the second half, and it would be uh, an indeterminate number of games. Um, and he clearly wasn't all in with us. And so the trade was made. And we got Orlando Cabrera back. And there was a situation with a specific superstar player uh, about within a couple of weeks. And I only know this because I was, it was post start day and I was in the hot tub and the hot tub was uh, in the area between the, the, the clubhouse and the trainer's room. And in that room was the coaching staff, the training staff's dressing lockers and one player who dressed in those lockers with them uh, and didn't dress with the team. And uh, said player uh, was, uh, scratched from the lineup that day about, you know, a couple hours before the game. And I was sitting in the hot tub and Orlando Cabrera came back and Orlando's with the club less than a month. And it was already clear that he had a very influential presence in a positive way. This guy played hard, played to win, uh, lived life to win in many ways. Uh, and then, and Orlando walked back and said, uh, uh, you know, que pasa? And, and the player looked at him like, Hey, what's up? He's like, you know, what the F? And the player's like, what? Why is your name scratched? Uh, tight hammy. He's like, no, 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 amigo. Um, I'm going to go outside and, and I'm going to take infield and grounders or whatever it was. And I'm going to come back. And if your name's not on the lineup card, you and I are going to fight. And he walked out. And I'm sitting there. I'm like watching like my favorite soap going, like that just happened. Sure enough, 30 minutes later, name was in the lineup and he played that night. That is clubhouse leadership. That is what happens instead of the Alex Cora meeting with Verdugo or the Alex Cora. No, that doesn't get to the manager. Um, and I had probably uh, four or five, maybe five incidents in my life where I got into a fist fight in the clubhouse or a physical altercation with a player. Uh, over things like that generally it was pitchers um and it was a position player a couple times in boston um but that's what you do that's what your job is as a leader on the team the man that's not the manager's job if the manager has to do that the manager is just the soon to be ex manager is what that is and that's how and those things listen those things happen every day in the clubhouse you got 25, 26 alpha male millionaires, now tens of millionaires, who have had things their entire way, who now don't come up in a, in a system, in a process that forces you to earn your wings in the big leagues. You come up having them. You come up entitled. And as long as you're hitting 330 with 40 homers and 140 RBIs, everything's good. But when you're not, it's not. And you're talking about, let, let's think about this. Chicago media environment, Boston media environment. And then, you know, the, all the stuff with New York. And I said this before on the show, there are three games to play in those cities that make them different than everywhere else. You have to play the pregame media. You have to play the actual game. And then you have to play the postgame media because every one of those things can snowball into the other one. Postgame media, you say something stupid. It rolls around to the next day pregame media where you have to, your teammates are talking about something that has nothing to do with the game. You go into the game, the game, post game. I mean, it, it's a cyclical thing that if you don't have the right manager, it runs itself out of control. And that's why Terry w and is was and is so good. And that's I think that's what, what has made Buck become better. Um, Buck, like I said, Buck Showalter was known as an overmanaging, minutia oriented guy, and it turns out he really wasn't. And and real quick, Bill, to go back to uh, to Buck. There was a, when I went to Arizona in 2000, one of the things that in the right, uh, Pedro Gomez hated Buck Showalter and wrote things about Buck Showalter that were, were not really true. But one of the things that they wrote about Buck was, listen, he tells players how to wear the uniforms and all this other stuff. And I had heard a couple of players had said that. And if you ask Buck, the explanation was very simple. 
you think about it, Bill, when he got to Arizona, his first year in the big leagues, he literally had no big leaguers on his roster. You remember how right. Arizona did oh, their yeah. expansion draft, right? But, and they that's the old school expansion right. draft. But, but also, he had 25 guys who didn't know how to act like big leaguers. Who right. didn't know how to dress like big leaguers. And if you remember the draft, you had Tampa taking the Consecos and the Boggs, and, and you know they had the veteran, we're going to try and win now. And Buck went into the draft with a fascinating mentality. We'll talk about it someday. But his mentality was, we're not going to draft big leaguers that can help us win games today because we're not going to win 100 games. What we're going to draft is big leaguers from other franchises that other teams see value in. And we can trade those guys because when we get to the postseason, only two or three of these guys that we draft are going to be on our team. But all the players we trade them for will hopefully turn into the prospects and the players. And so we had a bunch of four a guys for the most part there were big leaguers obviously but none of them had that personality of hey i'm running things here and so buck had to do it and he and 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 so those things led on that legacy stayed on and those are the kind of things that so pedro griffal uh either should have had a meeting after this interview came out with with uh with um middleton because Clearly, he's being called out in in a very, very uh, 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 plain way. There's a player saying, dude, you have no control of your clubhouse or your players. They do whatever they want whenever they want. The, as the owner, now, I, I, I've, I've known Mr. Reinsdorf for a long time. I don't think that's something he's okay with. Um, and you, you go from La Russa, who I think in many ways feels like he helped invent the game, to a guy who just says, hey, come and go as you are. That doesn't work, especially when you're talking about the pretty much the same group of players. And then, so now you have a, a, a locker room full of guys in Chicago who are like, I'm getting mine. Like, I'm going to, I need to drive in 100 to get this contract, or I need to, you know, steal 50, whatever it is. They're focused on everything but winning the ball games, And that's what happens. And, and uh, this is a, this, I'm telling you, this is a little bit bigger story in Boston than, than, um, it, it might be uh, made out to be for that reason alone. Um, but I will say this. Um, there comes a time in a manager's life and it's happened to everybody. It happened with Terry and Boston where you, you're there somewhere long enough that you lose control. You remember the, the chicken and beer in the Red Sox clubhouse, Bill? Yep. Right. That was under Francona, yeah. which was unheard of. And it was guys that you wouldn't John Lester. Being involved, and I don't know if John ever partook in it, but his name was tagged to it. And when guys like that, that's when a man, and it can happen. You just lose control. You're, you're there too long. Your system becomes kind of second nature, and guys start taking advantage of it. And when the veterans take advantage of it, you're 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 done. And, and I think Tito knew that. Um, but his style was never uh, abrasive, combative, over overseeing kind well, of well and that's what you got to hope with griff fall right he he right. sees and that's, what's happened that's why here as a, as a as a white Sox fan don't be disgruntled with griff fall the man, new managers have to learn as well right he may now next spring he may show up and say hey guys 11 p.m curfew you miss a practice you miss the game you're late for drills you run for whatever um but and I'm assuming that he be him being hired, his interview had to be ex exceptional given the guys that are out there being interviewed. He I, I he didn't miss this. So no. if you don't see a significant mentality change in the players, and you'll hear about it because the media will report on it. They'll pay they're gonna pay attention to this like crazy. This is when you'll have the media in the locker room, and they're allowed in the locker room way too early, but they'll be in the locker room and they'll have runners, they'll have assistants that'll be on the field set and they'll have the runners say, Hey, make sure you tell me which guys are out there for early batting practice and, and which guys are struggling that aren't. Or they take infield or whatever. God forbid somebody take infield these days. Tell me who isn't there. Or if you see somebody come into the locker room in their street clothes late, I want to know who that is. They'll start paying attention to those things to see if if the inside clubhouse message changes. And those are they're little things they may in the media, but they're enormous things if you're looking at a club and, and trying to find out reasons why they're underperforming or overperforming, right? I, the reverse example is true. In 1993, the whole team was at the clubhouse by like 1 p.m. in the afternoon for a 7 o'clock game. We couldn't wait to be around each other. We couldn't wait, you know, wait for the, the, the latest Dykstra debauchery story. 
or or, or the you know, potential borderline felony he may have committed in in the previous 24 hours. I mean, the stories were awesome, but we wanted to be together, so we were always in. And any good team will sh- will show you that. If you're if you're a beat writer who 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 thinks you understand your sport and tries to write like you know everything and you really don't, which most of you don't, one of the things you can tell about a team is is how early they get together in the clubhouse and how they interact in the clubhouse. We had our clicks in Boston. We had a Latin click, Ortiz and Pay, but it was never off on its own. We were always shooting the crap back and forth and going bilingual, everybody. Same thing in the 93 team. Hell, I had a teammate on the 93 team, worst teammate of my entire career, by far. I literally played gin rummy with this guy every day in the clubhouse. It was kind of how, it was like our, it was like an acid test for us. But but the, but the difference was at 705, I'd kill for him. Didn't matter if I liked him or not. He wore my uniform and I wore his. Though you can see those things if you're, but the media doesn't pay attention to stuff like that. The, and the, and the, when it goes back to the the clubhouse fights, I'm sure on the Phillies there were one or two in there a week, a, a week, and every day at seven o'clock those guys were best friends again. Yep, and, and you fought because you were brothers, right? You fought the way brothers fight. People annoy you. Can you imagine Lockerin with me for six months? And my ability to talk or inability to shut up, I'm sure I was annoying as hell. That's why I had to be good. Because if I wasn't good, I would have gotten my ass kicked repeatedly. But, but you, I, and I'm, I'm being facetious to a point, but the fact of the matter is you're 25 alpha males who have always been the big man on campus. And now you walk into a campus that you're the 12th man on. And you have to accept your role. And when I came up, I came up at the end of the generation of guys where you earned your way. And I know people say, oh, tough guy. But it, but it was true. It, it meant something. To be on the team, it was more than just putting the uniform on. And that that's what you miss today with a lot of the newer school guys and newer school managers. They don't right. have that, right? Wearing the uniform needs to mean something. And not just on a, yeah, I'm representing my fans. But more importantly, my 25 brothers and you are family by the way because you spend far more time in the locker room with your and on the planes and traveling and in the field with your teammates than you do your family and it by a mile for nine months a year so your family so and here's the thing you know you can't bullshit your family you can't lie to your brother and act like you're something you're not and that becomes very obvious very quickly in the clubhouse amongst players and the person that they're looking most for is the manager if the manager's not genuine, there's a problem and they can't get fixed. Which again is why a guy like Terry Francona and uh, all of the good, Craig Council is another one uh, that understand. Listen, I am who I am, dude. I'm the manager, and here's how things are going to be. And if you don't like it, okay, you can go somewhere else. Yeah, and so one of the other things about and kind of the last thing I'll touch on this because I've gone far longer and we're going to miss some content, but I, I thought this was important. Um, as a manager in the big leagues, the front office has to let you know they have your back. I, I, I you what you saw Moneyball, Bill. Yeah. And and one of the things that you saw in Moneyball was, uh, uh, Billy Bean ran the show. He wanted to tell Art who to play, when to play them. He wanted to tell Art how to use his bullpen and all the things that go with that. The problem with that is that the players see that. That's not invisible. And most managers will let the players know, oh, I don't want to bring this guy in, but I've been told I need to, or I have to, whatever. It has to be the other way around. Even if it's not behind the scenes, you have to, the manager has to know that the front office has his back. And in Boston, Theo always had Tito's back. Even if he disagreed with them, he had his back publicly. It was that old, you know, listen, we can disagree all we want in this room. But when we go out the door and into the locker room, we're all on the same page. One that was always the case with Theo and Tito. And there was some some deference on Theo's part because remember Theo was like twelve years old when he got the job, um, and and Tito was a lifer. So I think there was some deference on Theo's part, um, but he was mature enough to know how much he needed to give, and that that it was always a kind of a yin yang relationship, and and it was a good way in a good way. Um, but the ownership in Boston made it clear that they didn't they they were fantasy baseball managers. Uh, when you have an owner come into the manager's office and yell about putting a player in the lineup because that player wants to win worse than anybody in this locker room. And that player is the, kind of the exact opposite. The players hear that stuff, see that stuff and know that stuff. And you lose your, your manager loses hold of the clubhouse. So uh, 
in, in this day and age, you're seeing a lot of first time managers, you're uh, guys that didn't play in the big leagues, guys that, you know, all this, I, I can't even remember the name of the, the, you know, you saw all these extra pitching coaches coming from this, this program of teaching guys. I mean, those failed miserably for all the reasons they failed. These guys have no idea what it, what it means to, to, uh, to exist, cohabitate and live in an environment that, that is as collaborative as this one. Um, and that's going to be that a lot of times, like I said, now your managers win loss differential might be, it might be three or four games over the course of a season. Now it might be three or four games in the postseason, but over 162 games, the players play and he may lose a game here with a bad move because the player didn't perform, but there's always a player at the end of the manager's decisions who has to perform. Now in, in October, that becomes different because your manager needs to know his players. Yeah. You can start me on three days rest. I'm going to be fine. There are other guys you couldn't start on three days rest because they won't be fine. There are other guys who, and I mean, you heard, what was it? I I, I saw a quote the other day uh, about the Scherzer trade from the Dodgers. Apparently the Dodgers players thought that Scherzer gave up on them in the postseason. Yeah. In the postseason when they, when the Dodgers had gotten Scherzer, remember the neck thing Yeah, and the tire of the tired arm. Right. He bowed out of it. And I, I, I still have trouble grasping that, but he bowed out of a postseason start and he did it twice. And the Dodgers, there was, there was commentary around the fact that some of them thought he might've quit on the team. That would, I, that would end every happy thought of my career. If I thought my teammates ever thought I quit on them. Um, But all those things, and I know this has been a long winded show of things that aren't on the field, but these are so many things. All of these things are enormously important factors in the win loss record of your favorite team. And there, there are, and there are things, and, and the unfortunate part is for the most part, your beat writers, they're not the ones that are actually going to tell you anything meaningful. Your radio talk show radio guys, usually even less because they never go in the clubhouse and the clubhouse. If they know what they're looking for and they know what they're looking at, the clubhouse is where you can see everything, everything from a, how a team state of mind to all of it. It's out there. They wear it on their sleeve. And, and uh, I can walk into a clubhouse in, in many ways, I think, today and to tell you, wow, these guys are, these guys might win it all. Or, Puh. yeah, these guys already have tea times October 1st. Um, it's just, it's that obvious when you're in that environment. And again, what, what I found when I played is, is things like this. It came out in comments like these. In comments, when you see things like, he wasn't going to play. I decided he wasn't going to play. And uh, you have guys missing PFP and, and rookies sleeping in the bullpen. Those things, first of all, they never came out in the old old days because somebody's ass got beat in the clubhouse and that was the end of it. And it was before the media showed up. And that I'm going to go back to one of the most legendary human beings I ever played with, Darren Dalton. Darren Dalton knew the perfect thing to say and the perfect act to take every time. He called me in the back room a couple times and he knew my reverence for him. So I was like, you know, yes, yes, sir. And he said, Hey, listen, you can't do it this way. You're doing this. And it looks like this. And I'm like, Oh my God, I never thought of that. Or, or, Hey, listen, you've got to do this. You can't do this. And you'll not find, and as I got older in my career, you'll find some situations where I commented about leadership or coaching. And I overstepped my bounds a couple of times uh, with Fergosi. Um, but I thought that I was moving into a leadership position. I never did that with Dutch. I never spoke like that with Dutch or, or to the media because that was Dutch's job. And I can, as God is my witness, I can tell you there were three or four times in 93 when he came into the locker room, got to his locker, took his shirt off and turned around and said something out loud to the club that needed to be said in the exact verbiage it had to be said in. And you put your head down and went, oh, okay. That was the the general patent that was Darren Dalton. And those guys are, those are the David Rosses, right? Those are the David Rosses. Those are the Doug Mirabellis, the guys who will stand at their locker, regardless of where there's, it, they, Darren could have just punched out four times. Wouldn't have mattered. Dougie could have not been playing in two. They'll stand up and say something. And there's enough respect for that person that it is cardinal law. It's canon at that point. And those guys are, there are fewer of them these days because a lot of those lessons are learned in the minor leagues. A lot of those are guys that are fringe players. 
And there aren't a lot of fringe players anymore. And and that's not, I don't think that's a great thing for baseball. Anyway, listen, there was a lot of stuff, uh, other stuff to get to that I didn't touch on. John did uh, a lot of work, work this week that isn't going to be heard. <laughs> no, uh, John, the Angels but it was are great. dead. Let's just say this real quick. I'll touch it real quick. The Angels are dead. The Rangers are not. Uh, the uh, Shohei Otani, I believe, if I'm betting today right now, making a prop bet, Shohei Otani will be a New York Met next year. Um, and then the Rangers have done the opposite of Anaheim. Uh, Gunnar Henderson and Bobby Witt Jr., if you're not uh, uh, a hardcore baseball fan, you need to look those names up. Both those guys are doing some stuff. Uh, and I, I got to mention this. Bobby Witt became the first player in Major League history. Let me just say that again. Bobby Witt, who is all of like five years old, became the first player in Major League Baseball history to hit 20 home runs and thir steal 30 bases in his first two seasons. First guy ever. All right. Period. Now, I want statistical check on that for, for Friday's show because I'm worried that we might have overstepped our bounds there. But because I'm thinking specifically of like Alec Rodriguez. But, that stat is according to ESPN stats. Oh, okay. Well, it's all on them then. Yeah, think, it's, all, think, it's all on them. I think we're better than them. And I think Friday we're going to come up with the fact that I, I, I like Willie Mays. I will go back and check A Rod. No, I, and I'm not doubting you. I'm just calling. No, 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 no. I think A Rod in his first year didn't come up until late. And yeah, that's why. No, no, no. I, and I don't know what what. So, so right. I don't know what first two seasons means. Uh, right. Because right. Is so it your many call people... up September? Right. Or is, is, first is that your first season? season? Yeah. 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 Um, but Gunnar Henderson did some stuff uh, in Baltimore history, which you're talking about uh, a team that is a, an ancient amount of years old. Um, he, he hit his 19th home run um by august what was it uh first 100 games it's second most by an Oriole player in the first 100 games uh, and then Luis severino had a kurt Schilling 1993 june uh giving up 10 earned runs over the first inning 10 first inning earned runs over two starts and since the earned run became official 110 years ago he's the third yankee to do it uh over a two start span joining of all people ron gidry wow and joe page in 1944 all right listen uh, hopefully you enjoyed the show. I know I got going, but there is a lot of stuff that I'm very passionate about in that, in that discussion. Uh, Spotify, uh, Apple, anywhere you get your podcast, you can find the Kurt Schilling baseball show. Um, I think we're probably, I feel like we're the best kind of inside baseball show in existence. Um, I don't think anybody can touch us with that. I don't think anybody tries to. Um, and we'll actually, if you have questions concerning a team on the field right now, players on the field right now, uh, give us a tweet. I'm at Garrick38. Bill, you are? BGESPN. And John? Uh, the John Cassio. Give us the – or, or uh, on a, to OutKick. You can go to OutKick. Yeah. The, the website, upper right-hand corner is Shows. Click on Shows. You can find Tommy Lawrence Show, Dan Kakic, Clay Travis, and my baseball. A lot of really good podcasts in there. But anywhere you find your, your podcast, you can find us now. Uh, you guys have a wonderful week. Hopefully I'll be cleared up uh, by Friday. And uh, we'll catch up with you guys later.